Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I will be speaking with you over the next 15 minutes about the aortic and iliac arterial pathologies in vascular EDS. These are my disclosures. Over the next 15 minutes, we're going to discuss the differences between dissections and aneurysms and how they present in the aorta and iliac arteries. And then I'll cover management, and that includes medical management, open repair, and endovascular options. And just as a reminder, this talk is tailored for a mixed audience, anybody from who is a patient all the way to who is an expert uh, care physician. And uh, the idea is that we are all in the same room and that we are speaking the same language. And I'm also looking forward to the discussion at the Q&A session. So we'll start with aneurysms. An aneurysm is a dilation of an artery or the aorta to greater than one and a half times the normal size. And usually these are asymptomatic and don't cause pain unless they are ruptured. Aneurysms can come in a couple of shapes. One is a fusiform, as you can see here on the left-hand side with the black arrow, and then saccular aneurysms in which it's not the whole part of the wall or just only part of the wall that is aneurysmal, looks like almost like a berry. And you can see the picture on the bottom. This is a CT scan in a view that we call cross-sectional, and you can see that this is an iliac artery aneurysm. On the right, I just put a picture of what the aorta looks like, just to remind people of anatomy. The aorta is the largest uh, vessel in the body that carries the blood from the heart to the rest of the body. And you can see in this particular uh, illustration, this person has an abdominal aortic aneurysm. And then beyond the bifurcation, where at the umbilical level, it divides into the iliac arteries. So this will be the area that we are talking about. Aortic aneurysms can happen in any part of the aorta. As you can see in these pictures, you can have aortic root aneurysms, ascending aneurysms, descending thoracic aneurysms, thoracoabdominal aneurysms, abdominal aortic aneurysms, and of course, we're talking about iliac artery aneurysms as well. People can have more uh, than one aneurysm in different parts of their aorta. Uh, and when it is contiguous along the entire aorta, from the descending aorta to the abdominal aorta, that is the thoracoabdominal aneurysm. So just so you are familiar with the terminology. Now we care about aneurysms predominantly because of the risk of rupture. And when that happens, it can cause severe uh, onset pain, whether it's in the back or the abdomen or the chest, depending on the location of the rupture. And you can see in the CT scan here, this panel shows a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm with, uh, that is also associated with dissection in a patient with vascular EDS. Um, and I will be talking about dissection next. So here's what aortic dissection means. This is an ins a time in which there is a traverse tear in the intima of the aortic wall. So the inner liner of the aorta has torn, and then blood flows between the inner and the outer layers um, of that liner or the media layer of the aorta, and it creates this double channel configuration. You can see this video that is playing. This is an intravascular ultrasound. That's a probe that we can put in inside the aorta, and it records using, uh, it's an intravascular ultrasound where it records in real time the motion of that septum or that tear. And you can see it, you know, um, pulsating with every heartbeat. And if you look on the right, you can see how now we have, instead of a single channel, we have a double channel, the false lumen and the true lumen. So this is what an aortic dissection looks like. And the aortic dissection, similar to aneurysms, can happen in any part of the aorta. But in general, we think of it as a classification of type A and type B. I'm showing you three different classifications. The contemporary classification is the one on the right, in which if the dissection is in the ascending aorta, then that is a type A dissection. And that dissection can extend along the entire length of the aorta. If the dissection starts in the arch or anywhere beyond the arch, then and that is a type B aortic dissection, and it can also extend along the entire length of the aorta. And this can present with rupture. So when people have aortic dissections, there's a proportion of them who will have an aortic rupture. And again, that presents with chest pain or shoulder pain or back pain, and they can have the rupture that is happening. This is a medical emergency, obviously, and we have to take these patients to the operating room right away to treat this condition. The other thing that can happen at the time of dissection is a phenomenon called malperfusion. This is where the mesenteric arteries uh, and the renal arteries and the lower extremity arteries can all have blood flow that has been interfered with because of this false lumen compressing on where these arteries arise at the origin of the arteries. And I'm showing you here some graphic pictures of what that would look like. 
If people have malperfusion to their intestinal arteries, they will have abdominal pain as part of this picture. And you can see here is a CT scan that shows at the arrow locations, that's the celiac and the superior mesenteric arteries. And you can see the flap in the CT scan, this line that's blocking the origin of these arteries. And then these images that are rolling, these are the intravascular ultrasounds of this same case, same patient, in which there was a lot of compression of the celiac and superior mesenteric enteric artery. Uh, and this is an example here now on the right of what that looked like after we treated this person with a stent graft and opened the true lumen so that we can have better perfusion to these arteries. The malperfusion can also present with this acute limb ischemia. So that's the name for when the blood flow to the extremity has been interfered with. And again, they can have malperfusion. And uh, you can see here the ultrasounds or this, uh, these uh, pulse waveforms that show that it's interfered with and it's lower on the right leg. Another thing that can happen with dissections is that the aorta can become an aneurysm. So aneurysms and dissections, while they may seemingly are different pathologies, you really want to understand, did the aneurysm happen first? Did the dissection happen first? Are they coexisting? For vascular EDS specifically, the thoracic aorta and abdominal aorta can be involved both with dissections and aneurysm. And here are two papers, one from Mayo Clinic and one uh, that I authored as well, where we looked at multicenters. Uh, we had uh, we, uh, the Mayo Clinic experience was 24 patients, our experience was 53 patients. But the point here is you can see that the thoracic aorta and abdominal aorta are both at risk. Uh, and in the later series, we found 12% of the patients with vascular EDS had abdominal aorta that's involved. Now, we are learning a lot from the VEDS Research Collaborative Study, where we have been enrolling patients over time. So I'll show you some preliminary data from this. And this is, uh, you know, not necessarily for sharing, but it's just to bring you up to date on where we are. So we, to date, we have 64 individuals, 55% male uh, and 45% female. They have aortic pathology. And what you can see is that 63% of them had abdominal aortic pathology and 41% had ascending aortic pathology. On the right-hand side, you can see the age, the dots, these represent the ages at which they were first diagnosed. And you can see there's a broad spread between the age of 20 and 70 in terms of the time of their diagnosis. Uh, and in this series, we've also had, uh, you know, one ascending thoracic aortic repair and 14 descending thoracic or abdominal aortic repairs. So stay tuned. We will continue analyzing this data and have a lot more information about how aortic pathology presents in vascular EDS. Uh, iliac pathology also in our series, you can see we had 113 individuals, again, nearly half and half male and female. And the common iliac artery was the most common uh, affected one. And this was in 41 individuals uh, total that we were able to abstract data from. So there's still more data to be abstracted. This is still preliminary data. And again, you can see the A spread between 20 and 60. So broad uh, range of spread of when people are diagnosed. And to date, we have data on 14 operative repairs. Again, more to come on that. So what we have learned so far is the following. The patients with vascular EDS, when they present with aortic pathology, frequently they'll have a phenomenon called isolated infrarenal abdominal aortic dissection. So as I showed you, while people can have type A or type B dissections, they can also more commonly in vascular EDS have the dissection limited to the abdominal aorta. And this is a three-dimensional reconstruction picture of somebody who has uh, the aneurysm in the infrarenal abdominal aorta with the dissection flap. So you can see these cross sections one showing how there is a flap, and then the other one shows an area where there is not a flap. Uh, so this is actually quite a common configuration of how the aortic pathology appears in vascular EDS. Uh, this is the same individual, and you can see we can also see this with ultrasound as an alternative uh, way of imaging this, and this is on the bottom side uh, of the slide, and you can see the flap where this yellow arrow is pointing on the bottom right. Now, what about iliac pathology? Well, this is actually more common. So again, in the Mayo series, nine out of the 24 patients had iliac pathology, uh, and we had 40% in the more recent series, again, that's published in 2019, and 40% uh, of these individuals had iliac artery pathology. So not uncommon in vascular EDS. And what that looks like, again, this is an example of an individual here. You can see the three-dimensional reconstruction. You can see the aorta is not aneurysmal, but the iliac arteries are aneurysmal. And you can see the cross-section images, and you can see the one in the middle, so you can see a little dissection flap in the aneurysm itself as well.
And what's interesting is, is this configuration of the, your, uh, the iliac artery pathology, where they seem to have this shape of what I call bell-bottom iliacs, in which what I mean by that is that the first portion of the common iliac arteries appears to be normal in size, and then it flares out in a bell-bottom configuration right above the bifurcation to the internal and external. And here are three individuals, one from a case report that is published in the literature, and the two on the right are patients who are enrolled in the study and a couple one of them is mine and you can see the configuration again of the bell bottom iliacs um, also, one of the things we've learned, uh, you know, if we look at the external iliac arteries and common iliac arteries, is that the, the pathology can progress over time. And so you can see this individual who had their baseline imaging at diagnosis followed all the way to eight years out, and you can see the progression of the disease. And this is very useful information because classically, uh, when we think of uh, not surveilling people because we don't think there's much we can do for them, uh, we realize that in fact, surveillance can be quite useful because you can see the progression of the disease. Another way external iliac arteries can present uh, is by what we call thrombosis, meaning people can have a dissection. Uh, and you can see these are two pictures with the yellow arrows showing the dissection in one patient and then the thrombosis in the other. Uh, or you can have small dissection flaps, as you can see all the way on the right-hand side. This is a very common configuration for the external iliac arteries. So unlike the common iliac arteries that have aneurysms, external iliac arteries tend to have dissection sections. In terms of management, obviously, we want to keep them, the aorta and arteries healthy. So that includes smoking cessation, daily walking, and moderate exercise, as well as a healthy diet. Also, if there's hypertension, or even if there's not hypertension, we actually tend to lean to starting people on a beta blocker, plus minus potentially an angiotensin receptor blocker. Um, and there are variations in practice across the country, but those are the two medications that we commonly use. And then low-dose aspirin, I say plus minus, meaning if the patient can tolerate it and doesn't have bleeding complications from this, we prefer to put them on aspirin if they have a dissection. We also teach everybody to avoid fluoroquinolones, uh, given the FDA uh, communication about the warning that they may uh, be associated with worsening aneurysms and dissection. So this is something we recommend that we add to the allergy list. Well, when do we repair aortic aneurysm? So if we're screening and we're looking for them, then we're planning on repairing them if we need to. Uh, so certainly we have to utilize the data that we have on the larger population of people who have aortic aneurysms. And there are clear established guidelines for when we repair them. And in general, the takeaway message is that we repair abdominal aortic aneurysms when they reach five and a half centimeters or larger. We also repair them if they are enlarging in size. So the threshold may be lower, uh, meaning we may repair them at a lower size or smaller size in people with vascular EDS, particularly when they're associated with dissections or if they're taking the shape of a saccular aneurysm. But this is our starting point for the discussion, and we follow people over time. If the aneurysm is enlarging, then that is a time to consider repair. And we do know that the outcomes of surgical uh, repairs are superior when you, we do them in the elective setting. Said otherwise, emergent interventions have inferior results compared to elective settings. So we prefer to know if the pathology is there and plan the repair in an elective manner. There are also clear guidelines for people who have ascending aortic uh, aneurysms or aortic root aneurysms. So vascular EDS specifically is recommended to have those repaired at four and a half to five centimeters. Open surgical repair, the principles uh, still apply uh, to vascular EDS with slight modifications. Uh, you know, we want to be careful with gentle retractions. We want to, want to minimize uh, excessive tissue manipulation. We use padded clamps uh, and we use something called fell strip for the anastomosis. And we can see that while these data are limited from our prior studies, you can see that people can have this repair done even in, a, in an emergent type setting. So it is not all gloom and doom and there are potential solutions for this problem. Here is an example of an elective repair of an aortic aneurysm that I performed on a patient who had the infrarenal abdominal aortic dissection and enlarging aneurysm. And you can see the picture in the middle where I used very gentle retraction using Penrose drains and felt strips for the anastomosis. And then the picture on the right-hand side shows the repair uh, and she did well with that repair. For common iliac artery aneurysms, open repair is also an option. And this is a picture courtesy of Jim Black from Hopkins where he repaired these iliac artery aneurysms for this individual. And here's a graphic representation of how he did that. 
This is an example of a person who has a common iliac artery aneurysm, and it shows you, again, the growth over time. So these aneurysms don't suddenly appear and become very large. They actually can grow over time. And you can see he started with two centimeters uh, at the age of 36, and by age of 44, it had reached seven centimeters. At that time, it was really diagnosed and had that successfully repaired. And here's an example of what his imaging looks like uh, before and after the repair, again, uh, had successful repair pair. Endovascular options are also an option. Uh, aortic endovascular repair in a nutshell is something that we place through the femoral artery. And then it, the devices come on this uh, loaded mechanism that looks like a pencil. It's in my hands here, circled in yellow. We do this in a hybrid room where we have the imaging equipment so we can see uh, this via x-ray while we're repairing. And so there are two forms of this. There's TVAR and EVAR. TVAR is the stent graft that goes in the thoracic aorta, as you can see in this video, where the device is being deployed uh, to line the aorta. And uh, this is what we see on x-rays where you can see the device here has been constrained on the left-hand side, and then we deployed it on the right-hand side. Again, in terms of what is the experience with thoracic repair using TVAR, it doesn't seem to be very positive. Uh, and certainly, we don't have many individuals who've had TVARs. So the jury is still out. There's a lot of concern about using TVAR for repair in the vascular EDS population. Endovascular aneurysm repair is similar, uh, but in this uh, circumstance, it's in the abdominal aorta, as this video shows you, uh, where the device is being brought up and then subsequently deployed to again line the aorta. These were again designed for people with what we call atherosclerotic disease, not vascular EDS specifically. However, there are circumstances in which they are used. This is an individual who the diagnosis was not known at the time when they um, had the EVAR placed, and so we are following this individual, uh, but I've also personally have used it in people with, uh, in a patient with null mutation who also had a large iliac aneurysm and needed a branch graft, as you can see here in this picture, and he has done quite well with this repair. There are certainly tips for this. You know, we don't want to oversize our device. Uh, I use IVIS. This is the intravascular ultrasound if I'm dealing with thoracic aortic dissection, choosing low uh, radial forces for the devices, careful wire manipulation, and no ballooning of the stent grafts. And ideally, if we really have a graft in the proximal landing zone, meaning a surgical graft, that would be an ideal circumstance. And certainly with the exposure, I'm mindful of exposing the femoral arteries. I'll talk more about that in a second. For external iliac arteries, they tend to do well with endovascular repair. This is These are different kinds of stent grafts, but they're covered and flexible. And again, the goal is to have minimal to no oversizing, and these are self-expanding stent grafts, uh, but no ballooning of the uh, artery when they're placed. And again, we talk about open exposure and repair of the femoral arteries. And this is really based on a great study, again, published by Jim Black many years ago, where he detailed uh, a way to expose the artery and repair it. And you can see here in real time how we've done this as well. Again, very it's a small incision. We're able to see the artery um, and place our uh, access through that and then buttress the artery with support, circumferential reinforcement, uh, so that there are no issues with the closure site. The main issue we're concerned about is pseudoaneurysms or tearing of the artery. So we have to be quite gentle with our exposure and repair. So with that, I, I am coming to an end. I appreciate your time and attention, and I am looking forward uh, to your questions and more discussion. Thank you again.